On the Healthy Human Revolution podcast, Dr. Lori Marbus interviews nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests whose informative and inspiring stories will empower you with the knowledge to transform your life and health. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus. And today, guys, I have a special guest that I'm sure you've heard of is Drina Burton. How are you today? I'm very well. Thanks for asking. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, I am sure you have done so many of these and, um, but honestly, I'm a huge fan. I love sending people to your website because I feel like they're going to be finding compliant recipes, promoting health, and they're simple and easy and delicious all at the same time. So let's start with your newest book. And if you could tell us a little bit what inspired it, because you, this is your sixth book, correct? It is my sixth solo book. I did two um, projects with Dr. Neil Bernard from Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So I did recipes for two books with him as well. But this is my sixth, you know, solo cookbook. Wow. And um, after Plant Powered Families, which was my most recent before that, I, I wanted to kind of shift out of the focus of the kids because, um, you know, they've had enough attention. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but, um, you know, I, I devoted a lot into, you know, what I was doing with the kids in that phase of my life. And now that they're a lot older, not completely, you know, they're not independent entirely, but I wanted to really shift into, um, offering recipes for everyone, uh, families and, and everyone, but also just the premise of the book being kind kitchen. Um, I wanted to communicate that, you know, sort of the obvious title is kind kitchen, meaning, you know, we know it's kind for our health, this diet, we know it's kind to the animals, and it has, you know, a lesser footprint on our earth. So, you know, those aspects of being gentler to our world and ourselves. Uh, but the title in a more nuanced way means that um, my approach to living this way and to like fostering my community has always been from a place of compassion and, and to really meet people where they are. So in this book, I try to help guide them along. Like if you're new to plant-based, I offer lots of FAQs, um, sort of like tips on batch cooking and how to prep your kitchen from grocery shopping to the time you're starting to cut, uh, you know, your vegetables and get to the chopping board. So I really want to um, offer that, you know, I'm meeting you where you are kind of place with people so that they don't feel like it's overwhelmed or intimidating and that they can see that really these recipes can be enjoyed by anyone, whether you're hundred percent plant-based or maybe just moving into the diet, just kind of curious and just show you how accessible it is. It's not too hard and mm -hmm. it's delicious and you'll feel good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it always astounds me because I've been a physician for a couple of decades. And when you tell people about a plant-based diet, they're kind of, it's like, wow, what do you mean? Uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to cook. I'm like, I think you'll be all right. I'm pretty sure you've eaten some plants at some point in your life. And so I think your research, that'll be an amazing resource because it really is just a shift for people to even think about, you know, cooking without some sort of animal product in the kitchen. And, you know, you, you had a quote on your bio and one of your, on your website that I really just touched me. It said, no diet should involve such health liabilities, animal cruelties, and environmental tools. I think that pretty much sums up the plant-based diet in and of itself. I that's, love that. Yeah. Thank you. That's true. And I love what you say about you've eaten some plants because that's exactly what I say to people too. And they're new, like, just look at all the foods you're already eating that are plants, right? Most of us are eating bananas and um, potatoes and sweet potatoes, perhaps uh, beans, maybe not so much, but most of us are eating rice or almonds and like all of these foods that we eat and take for granted that that's a big part of the plant-based diet. It doesn't mm. mean you have to go start eating seitan or tofu <laughs> to be plant-based, right? Exactly. Exactly. I think people are just a little intimidated on like, well, what then is the center of their plate? And so when right. you see, I, I really, because, you know, always, I think as growing up is that, you know, at least, at least in our house, when we grew up, I, we didn't have a lot of money. So there was always beans as a center mm, <laughs> of our plate. Well, that's so, right. That is really helpful because when you go switch to a plant-based diet, like we did a decade mm -hmm. ago, um, my gut had no problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but it does help. But I am curious though, 
what is your first strategy when someone's like, like really just stepping up to the starting line here? Mm. How do you welcome them and say, don't be afraid. The journey's going to be fine. What, mm -hmm. what is your first steps? I think one of the first things I love to tell them is that they're going to enjoy so much more food that they're really going to find new flavors and new combinations and cuisines. They probably never, ever tried, or mm -hmm. just a flavor combination. They never tried and just their palate's going to open up and they'll enjoy food more than they imagined. Like that's mm -hmm. the first thing I think people feel they will enjoy food less when anyone you talk to eats plant-based, they say they love their food more now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one thing. And then the second thing I, I, I go back to that idea of looking at the foods you already eat and love right now that are plant foods. So maybe you love potatoes and there's nothing wrong with them. They've gotten a lot of, you know, bad press over the years, unfortunately, but if it's mm -hmm. potatoes, then find ways to make those more the center of your meals and, and function around those foods you love and know already right? And how to cook them. Because sometimes people haven't had a lot of experience cooking different items. Like maybe they don't know how to cook rice, or maybe they are intimidated to cook quinoa. But if they know how to cook rice, then they can use that as a staple for a recipe. And maybe find ones that use quinoa and substitute rice and just kind of get used to playing out those ingredients in more familiar ways. And then they can kind of expand on that. And I love that you're prescribing that there's going to be more taste, right? That I feel like mm. that is where people feel they're going to be deprived of, you know, these taste buds that they're so right. addicted to certain high salt, high sugar, high oily processed foods that they're like, well, what am I going to just live a bland life? And I'm like, no, actually you're going to, act, like you said, the taste buds change. The, the food is delicious. I said, you'll be depriving yourself of chronic disease. Of course, that is myself because- mm. I launched um, with a business partner I last year, Plant-Based Telehealth. So it's a national telemedicine company that <laughs> reaches all 50 states and DC and it's plant-based docs on it. And so um, it's really interesting to see this trend of patients, but they're really worried so much that they're going to be missing out on the delight that they've come to enjoy in their life right. with the, the flavors. So what are some of the most... Um, enjoyable flavors or things that you really kind of like, what would be kind of the starting point if someone's looking at their spice cabin and going, hmm, mm. will this satisfy my need to change or shift my, my flavor palette a little bit? Oh, good question. You know, I think one thing, a lot of people's spice cabinets are quite stale. Mm. So I remember cooking at a relative spice cabinet and I took some dried herbs out and they had no aroma. So they'd oh, probably wow. been there for like five, 10 years. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so, you know, really if they're going quite stale, they don't have much flavor punch. You need to get out and replace them. And most dried herbs, spices are so inexpensive, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's very few that are more pricey. And then um, there's some spices that I really love that people may not know, like smoked paprika is one of my favorite spices and, and, and paprika is a very common spice, but it's not very flavorful. Mm -hmm. So I use smoked paprika in recipes and it's just adds this really smoky essence. That's beautiful, not hot, spicy, just flavorful, spicy. Um, chipotle hot sauce is another one that I love again, more flavor than heat. Um, mm -hmm. And then lots of fresh herbs are, are really beautiful in plant-based cooking. And that can be intimidating for people, but if they buy some of the heartier herbs like rosemary, oregano, thyme, they tend to last a little bit longer in the fridge mm -hmm. and using those in recipes will really build flavor. I also really rely on lemons, organic lemons and limes and citrus just to bring more flavor with the zest and also the juice, but the zest adds a lot of flavor in recipes. And it's sometimes it's the combinations of flavors too. So when I'm like, I did a sweet potato hummus the other day in a video, and I was showing people that I'm adding some chipotle hot, uh, hot sauce and some chili powder, but I'm also adding a little bit of cinnamon. And it seems like an odd addition, but it plays off on the spice combination. And then with the lime juice, everything just like mm, comes together really, really deliciously. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's the combinations of spices. Um, but for sure to kind of clean out that spice cabinet, get it freshened up and um, open up to a few new additions. Mm. How long would you say that herbs and spices should be kept for? Like, like when they're looking at the of course expiration dates, if they have them, mm -hmm. but what is a, a general good rule of thumb? 
I think past a year they start to go um, mm. a little more flavor uh, deprived oh, <laughs> after I, about a year. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. if you're opening them a lot, right? And mm. if you live in a climate with a lot of heat, that sometimes mm. will also um, make the spices um, not just stale, but sometimes items can go a little rancid and in, in hotter temperatures. So if they have nuts in their cupboard and they've been sitting there for, you know, eight, nine months, and you've just had a hot summer and no air conditioning, then sometimes those oils in the nuts go off and you mm. use them in the recipe. And you don't know why it's not tasting good, but it's, there's the rancidity in the, in the oils of the nuts. Oh, interesting. Okay. Should we, how should we be storing, speaking of nuts, how should mm. we potentially store nuts? Is, is a freezer or refrigerator better or airtight thing? What can, should we use? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, definitely an airtight container. And I do store a lot of them in our pantry because we are not in a very hot climate. But in the summer, I tend to put them in the freezer, especially oilier nuts. So um, cashews and almonds, uh, Brazil nuts, I find they do. Actually, Brazil nuts can go off. Cashews and almonds, pistachios pretty do pretty well in the pantry. But then things like pecans, walnuts, um, Brazil nuts, they have an oilier texture and higher oil content, I believe. And so they just can, you know, those hotter temperatures can make them go rancid. So in that case, I'd put them in the fridge or freeze. They freeze wonderfully. Like you can put them in the freezer and, and they'll be there for probably years and be okay. Wow. Cool. Yeah. And well, speaking of all this, and we kind of just kind of jump past it. Well, yeah, what okay. is, you have a kind of a fun journey though. Can you tell us a little bit about your history because you were going plant-based long before many of us even thought about it so that that's true I, someone said to me the other day you were you were eating plant-based before it was cool <laughs> because it is a trendy thing now right and you know however we attract people to eating this way it works for me but um <laughs> i began um around the early 90s looking into the diet and I always had an interest in food, like from a very young age, but I didn't have a good connection with food. So um, as a child, I loved everything my mother cooked. I ate it all, but I also ate lots of junk food, right? Whatever was around. And I had this darling uh, grandfather who had a corner store and I'd run up to his corner store and he'd give me all the treats I wanted and sweets mm. and <laughs> I, you know, indulge in those and then go home and have dinner. So I put on weight as a child and I wasn't, you know, overweight or obese as we tend to see in a lot of children now, right? Mm. Um, sort of the trends with younger people right now, but I was just kind of chubby, but my mother, you know, in her best interest wanted me to lose weight. So she'd put me on diets and those mm. were not, you know, one, a kid doesn't want to be on the diet. Um, right. And two, they were very like a regimented diets of the day. Um, so we do these diets together. And this was like grade three, grade four wow. for me. So I became very conscious of food at an early age and not um, from a, you know, a good place. Mm. Uh, I didn't have a good connection to food for a long time. I didn't have eating disorders, but I didn't have, I wouldn't say it was a healthy connection, right? Um, I always viewed it as good things to eat or bad things to eat. And a lot of focus on calories and finding ways to try to lose weight and trying different diets. Um, and then my dad passed when I was young, when I was 11, and I turned to food even more, right, for comfort. And um, through that, as I moved into my teenage years, uh, you know, my focus was to lose weight, right? Like mm. a lot of teenage girls, I wanted to be thin, I wanted to lose weight. And now I look back and I think, well, it all led me to where I was, where I am now. Mm. But at the time, it certainly wasn't um, a, a good connection that you would want your child to have with food. Mm. Um, moving into my 20s, I came across some books like Fit for Life, which talked about food combining and animal products. And then Dr. or um, not Dr. but John Robbins mm. died for New America. That was a very pivotal book for me when I read about one, his, he just relinquished his whole connection to his uh, Baskin Robbins um, mm -hmm. heir, right? He was the heir to that dynasty, really. And he, he moved aside from that because he saw what was going on in the animal agriculture industry. And so learning about how dairy was so 
you know, really so wrong for our bodies, how we're not meant to digest it and process it. And learning about animal agriculture and consumption of animal products in, in general, it really was an eye opener. And that's when I started to shift into the diet. It was very gradual. I just kind of cut out red meat first because we thought, okay, that was the, the time when red meat was like bad but mm. the other meats were not right. <laughs> it's like, it's okay to eat pork. It's the white meat. <laughs> That's what the advertiser what? said, right? That's the what we heard. Truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so shifted gradually and then cut out dairy. And I was in my twenties having a lot of um, discomforts in my body. That's how mm. I'd explain it. Like my joints were painful. Um, I had really sluggish digestion, constipation. Um, I just did not feel good. And when I made that shift, boy, everything changed. And, you know, my skin was clearer and brighter. My menstrual cycles were much easier, especially after removing dairy. Mm -hmm. Such a big factor for women mm -hmm. and young girls to have painful, painful periods. Um, and then uh, so once I made that own, my own health connection, I was grounded in it. I was, I was embracing it, uh, but I still needed to learn more because of course it was very obscure at the time. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing was considered radical. <laughs> <laughs> like I was crazy. The, the weird vegan out there, the crazy vegan um, mm. cooking these weird dishes with beans. <laughs> And um, over time, you know, thankfully resources started to build. I had some books, Becoming Vegan by Vicente Molina and Brenda Davis. Mm -hmm. um, I collected more books as I went along and then some resources opened up online like PCRM. And then, you know, with the advent of social media, then we all get to have, you know, everything that connections now. Yes. Yeah, everything's there. Uh, but it was definitely gradual. And uh, I started with whole foods because there were no substitutes out really then. There was very little, a few plant-based milks, tofu, that was about it. So I learned through the basics and I'm, I'm grateful that I did because if I'd started now, I, I'd be overwhelmed with all of the substitutes that we have. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. No, that that's incredible. Because even in uh, 2012, when I transitioned myself and my family, even then it was unusual, um, but certainly not mm -hmm. the way it was been in the nineties. Oh my goodness. Um, but, uh, really, really amazing. So what was kind of your first steps? What did you find, or what have you learned over the years that it's just been a consistent, maybe thread, common thread, like use these food groups, do this, help people just kind mm. of get started. Do you have like basic stuff that you feel like everyone will kind of connect with? Yeah, well, I will say that for sure. I do not eat now like I did then, right? Or I didn't, I should say, I didn't eat as healthy and wholesome as I do now because mm. you do grow with the diet. So when I started, it was really more of an elimination diet, right? Remove dairy, remove meat. Um, and, I, you know, I enjoyed plant-based foods, but didn't have the sort of repertoire, the expansion of, items and, and ingredients that I do now. So mm. over time, and especially as we grew a family, my husband and I, that's when I really felt like I, I moved into much more diversity in the diet mm. and learning about more foods because it was really important to know how to nourish my child as well as myself. But you know, when you have a being that you're responsible for, it's, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's yeah. a big responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I did learn I think I feel like in the early days, I wasn't eating enough beans. I wasn't eating enough greens. And mm. that takes a little time to move into, especially if you're not used to eating greens in your diet, if your body's not used to digesting beans. And I think if you're in that category, start with the greens, start with the sweeter greens, lettuces, um, spinach is even not so bitter, you know, if you're sauteing it or adding it and, and letting it wilt down and mm -hmm. then move into the more bitter greens as you get used to them. So, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of lettuces, right? Not just one or two, there's tons of varieties. And then you can move into the cruciferous greens, like collards, kale, and the bitter greens, mustard greens, if you like them, I don't love them, but mm -hmm. you know, if you like arugula and those peppery greens, and then for beans, 
it's really helpful to start with the more digestible beans like um, red lentils, right? Mm -hmm. They're a very easily digested bean rather than go say, right, to eating a lot of like chickpeas or red kidney beans, which are sometimes harder for people to digest or soybeans. But there's so much out there. And especially if you look in ethnic um, aisles in the supermarket, you'll find a lot of varieties of lentils to try mm. and start with. Um, and another thing I really love right now is green chickpeas, which are mm. frozen. So they're kind of like green peas and oh, wow. they're, mm -hmm, they're amazing. One of my favorite things to use in recipes and to eat because they're, um, they're like a fresh chickpea and they're green oh, wow. and they're frozen and they just cook very quickly, a few minutes. Wow, that sounds delicious. What do you put those in? Like, what is your kind of favorite recipe to put those in? I actually have on my blog right now a green chickpea falafel recipe. Oh. And so I really, yeah, I really love that. And I just like adding in the soups or just um, allowing them to um, thaw in some hot water and adding them to mm. salad bowls. Um, I'm going to add them to a stir fry tonight. So, yeah. Mm. Nice. So, just getting around back to families, because you did mention that, mm -hmm. could you tell us what it was like to raise, well, one, you were pregnant, um, mm -hmm. plant-based, yes. and then dealing with a physician, I don't know, hopefully your physician was supportive or not, but, uh, and then, you know, raising your family in a world that's less like, less inclined to say this is normal, or how did you do that with your kiddos when they're going to birthday parties and all that mm -hmm. other stuff? I wish I had you. <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids are older. They were uh, 13, 15, and 18 when I switched to the diet 10 years ago. Now they're oh. in their mid to late 20s, and one's actually a physician. So wow. they're all plant-based. Yeah, yeah, they're all wow. good. They're my husband's plant-based. Okay, you know you do are... not look old enough to have oh, children that age. Thank you. I am over 50. Let's just say that. <laughs> but uh... Wow. <laughs> you look 30. You look oh, 30. I'm sure uh, people tell you that, but honestly, truly you do. I would not have known you even uh, had any children at no, all. No, um, no, thanks. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I think, uh, you know, I was never unhealthy, so I think that right. helps. And then genetics, I sure have somewhat to play with it, but uh, certainly eating a plant-based diet um, and avoiding right. smoking and alcohol and all that yes. good stuff, but yes. definitely helps. But you're exactly right. I feel, I mean, like, I, you know, I tease my kids, like, listen, I know at some point my body's going to tell me, yo, you're not, you're not, you're 20 year old. I was like, I really feel <laughs> like, like, yeah. And so yeah. And that's the joy and beauty of eating this way is people get into touch with what it's really like to live a life of norm. What this is normal. Like this mm -hmm. is normal eating mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. feeling well, having energy <laughs> that is normal, but yeah, it's amazing. But you know, I wasn't pregnant being plant-based. I mean, obviously I right. ate a lot of plants, but it's, um, but tell me, you know, what was like, what was that like? What that kind of um, worry or did you, yeah, you know, what, yeah, I, it, it was, it wasn't easy. I wish I had a doctor like you at the time. Um, it wasn't easy for sure with my first child, Charlotte. So we had a, a midwife through the, in Canada, you can opt for a midwife or a doctor and you can still mm -hmm. have a hospital birth, but you can opt for either or. And so I went with a midwife and she was understanding. So I was thankful, right? That she understood the diet enough to be like, this is fine. She said, people have babies all over the world and lots of different diets. <laughs> there is, right? That alone is a wonderful thing yes. for someone to admit. <laughs> yes. Like people, you know, women eat just, you know, rice and beans and areas she said to me once and it's okay so you know she knew she said, as long as you're taking some supplements that I know you're having xyz then we're good right so mm -hmm. that's you know a thing you need to look at your b make having your b12 and I, I think vitamin d is important for most people depending on where they live mm -hmm. and when you're pregnant um, the essential fatty acids the epa dha are important as well um but uh when I was moving in close to my due date it got mm -hmm. tricky because the short of the story is my dates were off, but mm. we didn't know it at the time. So I was measuring very small and oh, they wow. started to monitor me for about a week. I was getting tests done and sure. in the hospital test after test. And all I could think was, is it because I'm vegan? Mm. Right. And is this what other people are thinking? Is it because I'm vegan? Uh, and she was perfectly healthy. She was there was nothing wrong when she was born. They could see that 
she wasn't ready. She just wasn't ready. She was, mm. or my dates were off. Um, but you know, it's like anything when you live this way and it's not the standard we opt for, Oh, is this because right. Right? you get a cold and someone says, Oh, it's because you're vegan. Right. Oh, no, sometimes we catch colds too. Um, so that was, that was tricky. And then the baby visits were a little challenging mm. as you know, we moved into past the midwife and had GPs. Um, and I, the diet didn't often come up with, with the doctors, but what I remember vividly was weighing her every week or month and wishing she just got big and plump <laughs> because the growth charts, you know, were she was always measuring so low and partially mm -hmm. because I was breastfeeding. And at the time, those growth charts were not representing breastfed babies. Mm -hmm. And two, they certainly didn't represent babies whose moms were eating plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, she was on the 10th percentile. And so I kept reassuring myself, well, some children have to be on the 10th percentile. Some have mm -hmm. to be on the 90th and genetics have to play into this. But as much as my mind told me that my heart was also like hoping she would just gain a lot of weight and bump up. She never did. She always stayed mm -hmm. on the 10th percentile. My second mm -hmm. child always stayed on the 50th percentile. <laughs> and my third child, I didn't bother worrying about it. I was like, I know better now. By so, then you're like, um, yeah, we're done. <laughs> we're not even weighing you. <laughs> you know, and, and in the meantime, you know, she had abundant energy. She mm -hmm. was rarely sick. She mm -hmm. did not ever have antibiotics like as a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of these things were like signs that she was so healthy. Uh, but you still had that doubt. So I, I joked with Brenda Davis, who was the co-author of Becoming Vegan, that I'd take that book with me to the baby visits, leave it in the car, like research before I went in, mm -hmm. and then come out and cry in the pages because, you know, the overwhelm of oh. being with a professional that, you know, will doubt or judge you. Mm -hmm. That's hard. And I'm grateful that now the diet has more support, more awareness. Um, but I still think if you can find someone who is a yeah. plant-based specialist, then that's the way to go. Yeah. We, uh, so we launched uh, plant-based cell health in March of last year and we have continued to grow. We have nine doctors on there right now. And, uh, it's really interesting. I have patients from around the world, but, uh, the most intriguing ones are the ones are like in South Dakota or the interior mm. of Alaska or Wisconsin. They're like, one, it's hard to find a doctor. Number two, mm -hmm. plant bases, but now we're accessible everywhere. And it's been really fun to provide a service for, granted, it's telemedicine. It's not the hands-on that you will, will still need, um, but we can offer that guidance and support and labs and other stuff. But, you know, allowing the patient to have the opportunity to speak to someone who is knowledgeable in their way of living, living it themselves. And then also have the physicians who, this is a, such a joy to, to take care of patients in this manner that they mm -hmm. won't be able to in their regular job. And so um, it's, we're meeting both needs and it's been really fun and it's a, a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so it's a, we're really super stoked about it and see where the potential is to grow and maybe change right. the landscape of America as far as, you know, how medicine's delivered and taught and stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's really fun, but I'm, I'm glad you persevered and now offering your you know, the yeah. lovely skills you have in the kitchen. Cause I, you know, even when we switched overnight, it was a patient actually who <clears throat> 10 years ago, her daughter, um, there was some, uh, uh, there was a story in there, but her daughter, uh, went plant-based and came mm. off some ADD meds. And the only reason she went plant-based is because her mom told me one day in clinic that her meat and dairy upset the mother's stomach. And I said, well, stop mm. eating dairy. <laughs> Not that I was yeah. vegan, but I was like, well, stop eating these things. If there's, you know, what the, there's other foods, I, I promise. And the daughter went on a diet with her mom and at 16 and a month later was off of two ADD meds on her own uh, tuition. Yeah. And so mm. when she brought her daughter to the appointment and told me that, I was like, what? That is so amazing. And I was like, that is way cool. What did you do? Mm. She goes, she ate what you told us to. I was like, what did I tell you to eat? You know, I was like, no meat and dairy, but like, okay, let's talk about it. Right. Right. And then I found T. Colin Campbell's book, um, The China Study, and read that book wow. in two days. And yeah. 
went home and said to the family, we're going on a plant-based diet. And everyone's like, okay. <laughs> so we are like, well, mom's going to be cooking anyways. This is what we got. And uh, yeah, it was been a really cool journey. But the one thing that really was like, I stayed up late that night when we made that decision and I cleared everything out was mm. what do I cook for the family now? Like I was thinking, right. how do I substitute the meat? But, you know, I think that's another thing we do is we look for one-to-one -one substitutions and expect it to be the same, but it's not, it's a different way of no. thinking. Exactly. It really is. There's so much to delve into there. I love um, that you, I love that you made that decision from uh, Dr. Campbell's book too. That was kind of also like when I had the girls, um, I had two were born at the time and I read that book. Mm -hmm. I did, I didn't read it as quickly as you did. It's not an easy book I, to read. No, right? but I was so like, like if yeah. you literally could see a brain exploding, that would have been mine. It's like, I don't understand uh -huh. why I was not taught this. Cause look right. at, I've, I've been in practice a little over a decade at that point and going, what did I mess up with other patients mm. that I had an opportunity to potentially make a difference? And I understood that I have to live this lifestyle if I'm going to tell someone else to do it. I'm not going to say, go do yeah. this and I'm not doing it. So it was a very simple decision. Now, what, how was that journey implementing it in practice into a medical practice in Western Colorado? Not well, easy. That's a separate issue. <laughs> but anyway, yes. Speaking yeah. about people looking at you professionals. Yeah, they look right. at other colleagues and I'm I don't tend to be very mild but yeah exactly so I love that you took it even with the medical establishment yeah. doubting you and mm. it, you know like it, there's a bit of a backbone involved with it right like mm -hmm. it, it, you either have some support from people around you who are you know really cheering you on to do it or you know deep in your heart and soul that it's the right thing and you just have that like you say perseverance to to keep going and that's mm -hmm. all i really feel like i had at the time with the exception of those couple of resources that really to me the science was there in that book mm -hmm. and and the resource even with becoming vegan seeing her research and and knowing that hey this is real mm -hmm. um it's not just me you know playing around with my preferences for how I want to mm. eat. Um, so yeah, with the, with the girls, um, I forget where our question was, but I think yeah, that was back. Like, what did you do as they got older? They go to school, they right. go to parties. Right. Like, like, what do they want to do? do? How does that conversation go? Cause I know how it went in our house, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm really curious about your kids and how that transition was too, because uh, I, I have a group on Facebook. It's, it's called plant powered families because I have oh, a lot nice. of families that want to, you know, be supported making that shift when their kids are older. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you start from birth, it's easy. It's all they know. Not that it's easy, but it really is all they know. And right. kids grow to love the food they know. Like mm -hmm. if your child grows up eating spicy foods, they love them at an early age and anyone else would find it terribly spicy, but their palate has adjusted, right? Mm -hmm. um, if your kid is growing up eating um, mac and cheese, well, that's kind of what they're going to love and know and want to have all the time. So mm -hmm. if you're presenting them with lentils and sweet potatoes and avocados, they're loving those foods mm -hmm. and what's not to love in those anyways, but um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, they, uh, our girls have always, um, been into the diet. Like I can't say they've wanted to explore anything outside mm -hmm. of it. People have asked many times, did they want to have a burger? No, they mm -hmm. haven't wanted dairy or a burger. And now, you know, if they go with their friends out, there are options for them. So if they go to a fast food place with their friends, there's usually an impossible burger or beyond beef mm -hmm. burger. And even though they don't love them, it's mm -hmm. not their favorite thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're happy to eat it with their friends mm -hmm. and have that bit of, you know, social norm kind mm -hmm. of, you know, experience, but they all are now, you know, still plant-based and loving it. And our daughters are now 20, 16 and 12. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, the early days were not so easy. And, and when they did birthday parties in preschool and mm -hmm. elementary, that wasn't so easy because I would always reach out to the moms and mm -hmm. ask what they were serving at parties, which is always pizza or hot dogs. It's mm -hmm. like pizza, hot dogs, sometimes sushi, it's almost always pizza and hot dogs. Mm -hmm. And then I would pack up the vegan equivalent for them. So mm -hmm. vegan pizza, or I'd make the hot dog and just put it in a package and send. And then I'd also send like a cupcake or a piece of cake 
because I wanted them to have it. So mm -hmm. as much as they had their own thing, it still felt odd for them, right? Mm -hmm. that, that they had to take out their container of food. But, you know, I also think that that helped to develop a bit of a backbone for them too, that it's okay to be different with something. It's okay to stand up for something. It's okay to eat differently and, and know that um, you're doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and it teaches them something too. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a lot easier now, you know, you can get oh, cupcakes, yeah. vegan cupcakes anywhere and that kind of thing. And people are very aware and often will offer it mm -hmm. for your child. So uh, it's, it's much more convenient. Um, yeah, but they all love their food. And, and as they get older, and, and you probably had this experience too, mm -hmm. you know, they may be picky when they're young with certain things, but as they get into those teen years, they start to embrace more and more variety. And mm -hmm. they maybe are liking greens when they didn't before or broccoli or mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you see that they're eating those wholesome foods because they want to. Mm -hmm. really want to yeah mm -hmm. and they feel good too right so it's yes. it's interesting because I help you know a lot of families transition <laughs> you know all yeah. ages and uh just with my own children you know I when I went through medical school uh see my daughter is 27 now Emily's the physician and she's going through residency family medicine residency in Boston and my boys are 25 and 23 and so they were five, three and 10 months when I started medical school, because I stayed home for six years and had my kids. Right. And right. Um, it was interesting when we, when you're that busy and <laughs> don't have a whole I can't lot of time. even to... imagine actually. No. <laughs> it was not an easy task. I was like, and I was raised the same way. Cause like I said, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but uh -huh. you, you ate what was in front of you or you'd wait till the next meal. I mean, that's just right. the way it was. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just never knew any different. I never bought or dreamt of being a short order cook for my family. I was like, y'all eat what I got here for you. Cause one, it's yep. what we can afford. And two, it's what I've mixed. I don't have time yes. to listen to you whine and complain. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so many parents now are afraid. I call it afraid to parent. I'm like, it's called mm -hmm. being parent. You make these decisions for your children because you don't let a four-year-old dictate what she eats for dinner. She eats right. what you put in front of her. It's healthy. Right. You should make it a healthy meal, but right. she'll be fine if she doesn't eat tonight she'll eat in the morning it'll be right. okay she'll soon learn her palate will develop yeah. and kids intuitively know when they're full don't force them to eat more no. let them eat what they want it'll be okay you offer the healthy foods they do what they want i always say make sure there's something on there that they like of course yeah. um but you know but when we would go out so the kids when i transitioned overnight i was like we're done threw it all out <laughs> Cool. All out. It. Mm -hmm. And uh, the husband's like, well, you're still cooking. He's like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and he went on yep. my husband. He's Filipino. So he's an inch shorter than me. I'm five, seven, he's five, six. And my kids, um, you know, my daughter's tiny. She's five, two, but my boys are like five, nine. So they eat a lot. Those boys, I can't mm -hmm. keep up. And my husband loved junk food growing up. He loved it. You know, he would eat junk food driving to work back and forth because it was an hour drive mm -hmm. for him where we lived. And uh, he gained some weight. I never had, yeah. like I said, I, I never had the weight issue or anything. But uh, what was funny was how he lost 70 pounds and 50 of it in three months. So I was like, mm, we are wow. on to something. Yeah, it was That's a big deal. Huge. <clears throat> and feel so much better, you know, and now we just can't imagine. But what we said was, listen, when we go out, y'all eat what you want, but at home, this is what yep. we're eating. And I also gave them, I was like, okay, you guys can do this with me. And plus they were always in the kitchen with me. Cause that's mm -hmm. how, again, many hands make light work. Right. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you live here. This is part of your, <laughs> this is part of your rent, right. you know? So they're like, I could give you, you could give me a thumbs down or thumbs up or eh, if, about a meal. And I'll take that to heart and work harder. And they loved it in the beginning. Like, yeah, mom, I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> I'll show you power. <laughs> yeah, it was good. So I gave them a little, you know, the reason to be polite full. Well, I gave them some voice with, you know, and, and owning that and saying, okay, I will make it so good that the next time you eat it, you'll go back for seconds. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, you just watch uh -huh. me. And that was how it started. And um, it was really good. I mean, and plus my boys, my, especially my young one, he relished, plus he's half Asian in Western Colorado. Like, there's very right. few Asians. Okay. Right. Um, you're like, you definitely, the white side of him is not showing at all, but uh, the boys are funny, but the little one, he's like, I'm the token Asian vegan. It's pretty cool being different. I'm like, 
then oh, go I own love it. Love him. That's amazing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was really fun. That you know, we just made it a learning process. Plus, we had always mm. gone to like, hey, let's pick out the produce that you we've never tried. We made it an adventure, literally mm-hmm. an adventure mm-hmm. of taste. And so I'm I'm thankful that how we raised the kids again, so they were prepared. Yeah. Honestly, the foundation was there to switch to something like this, and all of them have done very well um, on it. And it's a been really really quite a blessing so um mm. yeah that's it you but, really yeah. made it a, a family affair though right yeah. you really involved everyone and that's I think where the yeah you know, where the success comes but also like you say not being afraid to say hey I am the parent here yeah right? absolutely and, and yeah. also not afraid to keep working and honing the skills of cooking yeah. and time and um yeah. I know you know the one thing that parents always say to me which always kind of confused me at first was well, I have to cook three different meals. I have my healthy meal for myself. My husband still wants his meat, but my kids want, you know, Chick-fil-A or they want the McDonald's. I'm like, how old are your kids? You know, I'm thinking teenagers because they can go drive four and six. I'm like, wait a minute. Why would you give your kids unhealthy foods? Are you wanting them to be ill? Do you want to promote these? Um, And it's like, they didn't even think they're just thinking this is the easy out. It's like, this is not an easy, what you're choosing is, is, unhealthy a future yeah. for your kiddos and so yeah it's a really interesting conversation with parents because mm-hmm. you don't want to insult them or accuse them of anything but you kind of have to say listen yeah. this is what you're doing and they're like oh yeah it's like yeah. I know you love your kids so stop it <laughs> yeah right exactly and that awareness right I think sometimes <laughs> parents we we guilt ourselves into doing mm. these things for our kids too thinking oh let's just give them the treat or you right. know, I'm so busy right now. We'll do this. Uh, but in the long run, you know, you have to make those steps towards, you know, the long run in, in perspective. And right. uh, I, I, I did a post years and years ago about um, because this topic came up when, when someone said to me, um, it's, it's not fair to raise your kids vegan. Uh, what if they want to do something different or it's not fair, like uh, you're forcing it on your children. And I wrote this post about the the notion that as parents, we do impose our beliefs on them. That is Mm -hmm. kind of what parenting is, right? Mm -hmm. We choose what school they go to. We choose uh, at early ages, at least, what sports they're involved in. Mm -hmm. If they're religious, um, Mm -hmm. part of a religious, um, you know, tradition. Yes. So this is what parenting is. And at some point they may veer off it when they're older, but that is what we are tasked with as parents. So Mm -hmm. it's not imposing a belief any more than anything else we do. And it's Mm -hmm. imposing healthful habits is really Mm -hmm. what it's imposing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the whole parenting thing is, is so interesting to me, but um, yeah, exactly. I've had certain people say that, but at the same time, I was like, listen, you're just Mm going to let your child decide when they don't have the Mm -hmm. mental faculties or experience to make the best decision for them. That's being an irresponsible parent. Right. You know, and I, what we did though, as the kids were older, you, you got to give them the independence and freedom to make Mm -hmm. decisions that they're ready for. You know, you're not going to let your 10 year old watch a rated R movie. I hope not, you know, you're not going to let your, I certainly wouldn't hope you would let your, you know, 13 year old start dating an 18 year old, you know, right. and these, these are things, that, you know, you just things you just don't do. Why mm-hmm. would food be any different when there's such yep. long lasting harm that could come from make, you know, instilling these behaviors so early because it's, it's that relationship, like you described when you were younger, that relationship mm-hmm. to food has to be healthy. It has mm-hmm. to be understood that this is nourishing your body it's going to provide you the the body and the health for you to go do what you want to do in this world and I I agree 100% that it was really interesting I had a when you described that your mom imposed the diets on Mm. you just for the weight loss and concern for you she's doing that out of thinking she's doing the right thing but it but it creates this weird relationship in like, oh, food is not there yeah. to nourish me. My food is going to make me more pain because I gained yeah. more weight. I mm-hmm. have a patient tell me one time, she goes, she could not give up her, she loved Coke, Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. She goes, you know why I love Coca-Cola? Because my dad, like we didn't have a lot of money, but whenever my dad would come home from wherever his business trip, it was our treat. So it was like mm-hmm. a reward. And she, every mm-hmm. time I drink that, I revisit those feelings yeah. and now that her dad had passed. And I was like, 
Wow. That is really powerful. And yeah, another one that said he couldn't eat beans because um, when he was a kid, they didn't, it was a really bad situation. And they, he saw, you know, cans of beans being up and the bugs crawling out and like, he uh, just couldn't get right, away of from course. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's so amazing to me that childhood mm, yeah. relationship trauma, it's just, um, but it's still no excuse not to parent the way that we should our kids so they yeah. can grow up and be independent of any food dictating their future or health and Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And food is a habit, like anything, oh. like how our diet is a habit. And yes. so, you know, as adults, we can change those habits. It's harder, but you can still mm. change and, and make shifts at later stages. And, and, you know, our bodies are pretty intelligent. And over mm. time, when you make those shifts, you get that reward, you know, that mm. feeling of, of health, and renewal that your body is giving you that you want to continue it takes mm -hmm. a little time but you do get it and then you're mm -hmm. you're in it right then you're, you're feeling <laughs> it you're loving it um but diet is completely habit and uh that shift can be made you know for older children but also as adults for sure mm -hmm. so speaking of habits which is one of my favorite things to talk about what are uh -huh. some of the the good habits to do in the kitchen that would lead someone to make one eating mm. plant-based easier. Cause I know I hear tons of complaints. It takes too much time. Mm. I don't know what to cook. Things aren't ready. La, 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 la. What do you do? What do you, I know you get those questions. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, one thing that I do when I like make a big product shop. So I tend to be at the store a lot because I'm recipe <laughs> developing and, and I'm always in and out of stores getting things I need. But when I do a big product shop, I bring everything home and give it a quick wash because mm. one, I think it's really important. I mean, and I did this way before the pandemic as well, because produce travels through a lot of hands and there are surface contaminants, right? So it's very simple though, a sink full of water, a drop or two of natural dish soap, and then get things in and get them you know, you don't have to scrub them, but just give them a quick wash and rinse. And then I put them in my dish drainer. That's what my dish trainer is for. <laughs> and most of the items that can, I mean, most of our produce can be prepped in advance like that, you know, hearty mm -hmm. vegetables like carrots and celery and cucumbers, zucchinis and apples and oranges and lemons. And if you have all of that already done, then when you're reaching to get prepped for a recipe, it's less, you know, you're not taking that extra step then to wash the red pepper, wash that celery, wash the cucumber, or if you want to have an apple, you don't need to wash it. It's there, it's ready. So yeah. that's one step. And really when you do it all at once like that, it takes about five, six minutes. It's really quick. Mm. Um, and then there's some items that I encourage people to batch cook. So if you're making rice for a particular night, always make more, make you know, at least twice what you need for that night, because you can then use it several nights or days in the week. Rice keeps in the fridge for about five to six days. If not opened, if opened a few times, it may be like four to five days. Uh, but having that batch cooking of things like rice and starches and beans, then they're at the ready. So I also always um, cook lots of potatoes, lots of sweet potatoes, have those in the fridge ready to go and um, batch prepping certain recipes like hummus freezes really well. So if you're gonna make hummus, mm. make a lot of it. I freeze it all the time and I do a big, big, big batch in my F16 cup processor. So, wow. uh, you know, fill that guy up and, and then package it up in small quantities for the freezer or the fridge. Um, so simple things like that, that really then when you're prepping meals, you can pull things out. There's sweet potatoes there, there's grains there, you have beans have lots of canned beans, um, cook lentils in batches, and uh, you know, then have some staples in the freezer as well so that if you are short on vegetables that are fresh, you have some key ones in the freezer, you know, green peas, corn, frozen, um, cauliflower, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, repurposing your mm. recipes. So that's something I talk about a lot in the book is, if you have a given recipe one night, so maybe it's um, a pureed soup mm. and you've made that soup and you have enough for another night, make it something different. Maybe it becomes a pasta sauce and mm. you can add some things and, and kind of embellish it as a pasta sauce. And what you looked at as a soup and having mm, not so exciting leftovers the second night, 
it becomes something new and fresh. So mm. I, I try to help people rethink, like just look outside that box a little bit and mm. use their own intuition, not be afraid to kind of get in there and, and make magic happen. <laughs> mm, I love that. That's, ex I love the repurposing too, because then it's not a leftover. No, <laughs> no. Heaven forbid we eat leftovers. It's no. a repurpose. It was just already made. Here we go. Um, we actually, for the first time I had made homemade samosas and I use, mm. instead of creating my own, you know, um, type of whatever they make the, with the, the dough, the, some of the dough. Yeah. Yeah. I just use the brown rice paper that you'd use like on spring rolls and I air yeah. fried it. It worked great. Yeah. And then my brain starts going, I could use it for this. I could use it for that. I'm like, wow, I could put all sorts of yummy fillings in there. And there you go. The air fryer is so simple. Um, yep. Man, oh man, my brain went crazy with that. Right. New uh -huh. way of wrapping something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's low in calorie and simple and easy to do and quite delicious. But I love the repurposing component of that. What are you, some of your, um, I know you like, you do a lot of bowls and salads and different mm -hmm. things. What are some of your easy, yummy bowls? Because mm. you have that orange vinaigrette dressing. Oh my gosh. That's how I first found that website. <laughs> oh, like, really? That oh, really? Quite delicious. It is. Oh. I've made it for people and they're like, this is my new favorite. I mean, it's been more than a few people actually. It's like, yep, wow. that's from Drina Burton. Guys, go check out our oh, website. Cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. What are your favorite bowls? Cause I Thank know you. that's a big thing for families. Yeah. I, um, you know, I love, um, to have dressings ready. Mm. I make a lot of salad dressings and I focus on those in, in the new book and Drina's kind of kitchen. I've got, um, one of my favorites is Buddha dressing. And mm. so it's got all kinds of umami elements with nutritional yeast. You kind of have to like nutritional yeast to like this one, but mm. nutritional yeast, um, tamari and, um, some apple cider vinegar. And it just has like a really, mm kind of irresistible quality to it and when you work that into kale or greens or hot quinoa it's so good on hot quinoa oh, wow. so I once you have a good sauce or dressing and you have those elements batch cooked like grains sweet potatoes then making an easy like a bowl is so easy to make you're just pulling those items out of the fridge maybe reheating some of them drizzling on the sauce and you've got a good lunch or dinner. It's mm -hmm. so, so fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. And I really love soups and they can step in as bowls as well. And I put them in the mains category in this book because mm -hmm. to me, they are a main course. And, and I think kind of undervalued in a way in, in, mm -hmm. in our diet, because you can really, you know, make a soup full with so many vegetables and grains or beans and lots of flavor complexities in soups. And then, you know, they could be pureed or they could be really thick. And if it's a really thick, chunky soup, you can kind of play with um, layering it in a bowl with grains mm. or maybe guacamole and greens and, and it becomes more than a soup, you know? Mm. Uh, so yeah, I love, there's a few soups in the, in the book that I, I make a lot and really enjoy. All right. Now I'm, I'm salivating. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I could have you come live and cook for us with the kids, the family would be like, yes, yes. Um, cause you know, we all tend to fall into, I feel like routines, like we go back to the for same sure. meals and, you know, and after a while it does get stale and you throw in something new and then you fall back to the same ones again. Um, but that is really some great. So the soup almost becomes the dressing, so to speak. It can for sure. Like uh, one of the soups in the book that I love a lot is a curried carrot lentil soup. And I like mm. that one so much because a, it always, you always, almost, almost always have those ingredients on hand, carrots, mm. onions, uh, red lentils, and then it's spices in there and it's really uh, delicious. It's pureed. So you don't see how many carrots are in there, but there's a lot <laughs> and it has a beautiful color and flavor. And when it's really mm. thick, you, you know, you could even make it, um, add it with pasta and add some cilantro mm. and more lime juice and almost have like that kind of Asian influence sort of bowl. Mm. Um, and so again, and I, that's why I, I, within the recipes, I put little boxes in, in many of them with recipe renewal. And then my ideas of mm. how to take that recipe and renew it for nice. a different, and it does spark that creativity. Like you said, with the samosas, mm. it sparks that 
oh, I never thought I could do that. Right. Right. Oh, exactly. It was when I was looking for an oil free samosa, but they still had Mm. some oil in the dough. And they mentioned, well, you could use, you know, uh, rice paper. And I was like, what? I have some. In the- okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so off my brain went, but I love that, you know, don't, people shouldn't be afraid to mm-hmm. fail in the kitchen because mm-hmm. sometimes those failures will spark in, you know, some type of new creative idea and it's a great success. And I think people are afraid to experiment. I, I don't know what's the, yes. there's such a fear for some reason. It's like just yes. food. It's just the kitchen. I- <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I think it's because we maybe have been taken out of the kitchen for a long time for decades. We got used to many frozen meals, right. And also takeout. Uh, So some people don't know how to, you know, make rice or bake a potato. Mm. Uh, But I liken it. I say to some people like, you know, you get better with practice. It's like Mm -hmm. anything you do, you get better with practice. So just practice in Mm. being in the kitchen. It's kind of like, I don't feel I have the best um, skills at you know, interior design or, you know, <laughs> decorating my home, but I'm sure yeah. if I did it a lot, I would get better and better. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right. Because you learn the elements, you learn the basics, and then you can go from there. It's like, it's right. just like anything. It's like you right. learn to write and then you write a novel. <laughs> right. <laughs> you gotta learn your ABCs first. Exactly. You know, you're, it's a really good point. We've literally turned over our health to big food. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. quite remarkable man, that is amazing. I can't wait to get, I got to get this book. I have yet to get it. So I'm going to go grab it. (laughs) uh, Has it not been sent to you? No, no, no. I'll, I'll order it off. It's on Amazon. No, no, no. We'll get it too. Yeah. But I thought for sure you had a copy. I will make sure you get one after this. I thought you already had it. And I'm talking about the recipes and you haven't even seen them. No, but I, I've seen your (laughs) other recipes. I'm fully on board with Drina Burton. Let me tell you, but uh, I, (laughs) I am a true fan, but yeah, no, Definitely, if you have anything too that you would like to, with our plant-based telehealth, we have a ton of handouts that we like mm-hmm. to give. So if you have like a, a sheet or something about, you know, your, what you're doing and your books, yeah. and say, we'd be happy. That'd be great resource for so many of our patients. Okay. <laughs> and so please, we'll, we'll get that to you for sure. Okay. Fantastic. We have some recipe reprints too. So if we oh, send that to you, you could yeah. even give like some sample recipes. Oh, mm-hmm. fantastic. Oh, that'd be great. That would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because anywhere we can send them that will, they don't have to worry about replacing ingredients and just makes the decision easy. Yes. Is a win-win. Yes. So, yes. Oh, that is Great. fantastic. So I know I've kept you almost the hour that I, I could talk to people forever. We, I love yeah, it's, this. It's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would be the advice that you like to share with our audience for those who are thinking about transitioning or early into their phase or just something that you feel like a lot of people need to hear when they're walking into this land of plant-based eating that you really can do it Mm. and you really will love it that simple you really really can do it people of all ages have shifted there have been people in their 90s who've made the change and moving into plant-based and everyone who eats plant-based says they love their food more than ever Mm. so yeah just go for it and and take steps along the way. Don't beat yourself up for the little slips. Just keep moving forward with it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because yeah. one slip up does not negate the entire journey. And I always tell people, exactly. if anything, this failure is data. It's data to help mm-hmm. you move forward. Because if you don't have that experience, how are you going to grow? And so, good fabulous. point. Too, if you have a meal that, if you've been eating plant based, say for a month, and then you have a meal that isn't, you feel the difference. Oh, so like you say, that's really good data to, to work with. Mm -hmm. Very good point. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Um, People definitely know my, especially like my diabetics and their blood sugars Mm -hmm. go awry for days. And I'm like, well, what did we learn? (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That's fabulous. Well, thank you, Drina, so much for, you know, joining us. And we so appreciate your time and expertise in the kitchen and Everyone check out her book. The link will be below. And um, I can't wait to hear the feedback on what they're doing because of your, you know, lovely uh, advice. And it sounds like there's some amazing advice in there. And I can't wait to see it myself. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Lori. Such a pleasure to be with you. And thank you for bringing, you know, plant-based into the medical profession as well. Oh, thank you. (laughs) That's quite the journey itself. So (laughs) 
Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe button and the alert button so you will be notified whenever we upload any new videos. On Monday, we upload the Healthy Human Revolution podcast. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find it on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. Now, if you're looking for more resources on how to start a plant-based diet, sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, anything regarding wellness, we've got you covered. Check out HealthyHumanRevolution.com. And again, thanks for watching.